Next, we'll have Ambassador Joseph, and he will be speaking on leveraging collaboration and innovation to drive sustainable use of the Caribbean living marine resources. Uh, let me thank uh, New Church and the organizing uh, committee for inviting me here to speak to this forum on the issue of innovation, collaboration in fisheries to enhance food security in the region. Uh, to move into that point, I would like to put a historical perspective on the fisheries industries in the Caribbean. Uh, many of us, some of us would, and many of us would not know that uh, the fishing industries in this region started almost like an accident. That is very important for us to know that uh, when agriculture became a challenging industry for the British colonialists during the 50s and 60s. They were confronted with high numbers of uh, individuals that were very unskilled in the workforce. Most of these individuals were working in the sugar industry. After sugar and its importance and its, goods and its scope was reduced, the colonial government found it important to find an avenue whereby this unskilled labor could find some sort of subsistence existence. And uh, they went to conceptualize how they can use this workforce, this unskilled workforce, within the framework of the subsistence economy that existed, not only in Antigua and Barbuda, but across the Caribbean. So they developed institutions like the fisheries divisions as part of the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture and put in place a subsidy program that would attract the unskilled workforce into the industry. They started boat building. They started to give loans for fishing here. And many people entered the industry without any sense of creating a business structure around the, what you call the livelihoods. And what you had is fishermen and their families engaging in a subsistence type activity where they go to the, go to sea in the morning, have a catch, coastal fisheries have a catch, they come back to shore, no sort of idea of processing, preservation, except for what we call in the Caribbean salting and drying, we call it anti corn in the fish. And uh, that was the approach that fishermen have. Live for today, forget yesterday, don't think of tomorrow. And that concept established the foundation of what we have now as a fishing industry that will never conceptualize to be either sustainable, as far as livelihoods are concerned, or taking a role to provide food security. At that time, fish was looked at as a cheap source of protein. And as a result, even, lobster were, were, even lobsters were used as bait in fish pots at that time. Let's fast forward from that uh, foundation that was established upon which our fishing industry is being developed now. 
and we came into the era when the whole international community felt that there must be some order in the ocean. Large mountain states started to wonder why should we be at our, at our coastline and up to three miles out we're seeing foreign fishers exploiting our resources. Then came the concept of territorial sea. Then up from the concept of the exclusive economic zone to replace that large, broader scope of ter territorial control of the ocean. And during the negotiations to establish the Law of the Sea Convention that came into being in 1982, many large mountain powers realized that if the, if the concept of exclusive economic zone and territorial sea comes into being, it will empower a lot of small coastal states, especially island states, its countries, to the economical and military strategic detriment of these large countries. So during negotiations, countries protected certain interests. But we came out as winners in the final text of the Lord's Convention. That convention gave things to states like Andrew Gilman and Calcum country rights and privileges, but a lot of responsibilities. Responsibilities to manage, rights and privilege to develop. So we had a challenge to do both. This rights and privilege and responsibility was looked at within the foundation of where our fishery started, a subsistence, often China of agriculture, that is what I call it. Fisheries started as an offer of agriculture. So we became an irritant. Nobody knew what to do with fishermen. Governments had challenges in managing the newly minted 200 miles economic zone, exclusive economic zone. And the issue of collab collaboration and innovation needed to be addressed if we were going to realize the benefits that are expected with our new found marine resources. We saw opportunities. But how can these opportunities from a fishery standpoint be achieved within the foundation of an industry that started as subsistence, highly subsidized, without any public structure to ensure its sustainability? That scenario presents a very vulnerable shape for the fishing industry in the region. In 1982, these countries, most of them became um, uh, signatories, first of all, to the Law of the Convention, and then the Convention was adopted. And through international collaboration, we were able to establish our fisheries laws harmonized fisheries laws in the Caribbean, and then we link with the South Pacific Floral Fishing Agency through FAO, and set up a whole management structure for small-scale fisheries in Ireland. These management structures, unfortunately, was based on protection and conservation. There was nothing in these structures that speak to sustainable livelihoods and innovative fisheries development. As a result, where we are today, we have an industry that has been given the challenge to assist with the food security needs of our region. An industry 
that is almost given a basket to carry water. And I'm going to tell you why. Our countries give priority to coastal zone development almost solely for tourism type activity. The coastal zone is one of the most critical aspects of fisheries in our region. But the issue of tenure of territory for our fishermen don't exist. A developer, a developer comes to Antigua, for instance, or to St. Kitts, or to Jamaica, and they propose a hotel development plan that will seriously impact the resources that fishers would have at a coastal level. The nurseries and even coastal fisheries. And no consideration is given to property rights for fishermen. These coastal properties traditionally must be looked at in the eyes of fishermen who have been exploiting and finding means of livelihood in the coastal areas for many, many years. During negotiations, no thought has been given to how can you compensate the fishers and their families and even the industry itself so that it can continue to provide and, re and meet the challenge of food security in the region. So you consider employment, so a hotel will provide 400 jobs. The fishing industry just provides marginal jobs. Remember I told you the foundation upon which our industry has been providing the mentality to politicians and developers that we're just irritants. Fishing has no role as a leading sector in our economy. When all of that is said and done, you find that uh, you're giving property rights to a developer to own the coastal area. But those that uh, would be able for have no property rights. How can you reconcile that in an industry and expect that fishermen and their families and other prospective entrants in the industry would have any confidence in that, in that, in that process? So I want to put it on the table that the issue of property rights for fishermen something that must come back on the table, must come back and be given serious consideration by government, because that is the only way in which you can have sustainable livelihoods and proper planning and development in the industry. You can look at sustainable uh, at, as property rights in many different ways. Like for instance, let us take the project in Bad Uden. For instance, the PLH. PLH is taking up a significant part of our coastal areas. This is a huge, very huge tourism related project, which we need. No worries about, no two ways about that. The, the country and its economy need this project. But how can you displace persons that have been dependent? on the ocean for their livelihoods and replace them with another set of economic players. You can do that, but the perspective must always be what is the compensatory mechanism that you're going to put in place to ensure that through innovation and collaboration, you can still maintain your goal of food security and sustainable livelihood for the fishermen in place. There must be an economic cost put on coastal development so that, that those funds can be put into the fishing industry to do several things. This morning I was talking to a fisherman as I came into this room and I asked him, how is the fishing industry? How are you doing? He said, we're doing okay, but the cost of fishing is getting higher and higher and higher. I say, why? You see, one, the ocean is very warm now, especially in the coastal areas. So the, the, the fish stocks are migrating further and further out. It takes longer lines, um, stronger fish traps. It takes uh, more, more energy and larger boats to go there. 
much cause in there. We all know the culprits of global, global warming and climate change. But we have to think locally before we think internationally. Because while we're blaming all of the international players for warming our ocean, right here before our eyes, we see the displacement of fishermen through big corporations and big business. How can I tell fishermen there that you must continue to provide food security for our country, but at the same time, the areas that we used to fish that is being destroyed, that's not our business. You're displaced, but still find another way. No development project should encroach on the livelihoods of the original people that were involved in that space, unless there's a proper and innovative mechanism to ensure that one, we maintain our goals of food security, and two, we maintain our goals of sustainable livelihood for the traditional people that have been operating in these periods. I'm gonna close with one example. In the United States Virgin Islands, in the 70s and 80s, through funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, the whole of St. John's up to three miles of course was stirred into a giant protected new national park. They had a buyback program here, fishing here, buyback program which marked the end of coastal, the coastal players being involved in mountain activities. These coastal players were relegated into becoming taxi drivers, waitresses in the, in, 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 and, and, and waiters, bartenders in the transition from earning a sustainable livelihood and still providing food security to a hotel plant that is dominating the coastline. What are the other activities in the, in the marine environment in that same national park? Marine recreation, glass bottom boats where you can observe and watch everything, scuba diving. But alas, it wasn't the fishermen that transitioned into them. Big business that can afford big dive boats, huge catamarans, replace those fishermen on their property, coastal mm -hmm. area, and they were relegated into being just taxi drivers and waiters, not bartenders. That is not good security for people that should have been involved in the transition process, what compensation we got. They got nothing left. Let me buy your gear, let me buy your boat. You know, you get that, I'll buy a car. You know how long a car lasts. And then you lose the very essence of the tradition that we knew to where you are. I want to superimpose that on the role of international organizations and the role of like-minded countries in the concept of fisheries development and management. International organizations are very critical to allow us to maintain the rights that we have gained over the years under all of these international conventions and agreements. But something very sinister has been happening in the international organization that we have to be very much aware of. <clears throat> the Green Deal is huge in European and American, in, in European countries and the United States. What is the Green Deal? To ensure that as much as possible, we maintain the environmental, uh, uh, the environmental integrity of our planet. Nothing is wrong with that. But what is fundamentally wrong is that the programs in that Green Deal is driven 
primarily from Europe and the United States and being imposed on small developing countries that just do not understand from whence this Green Deal came. The Green Deal is telling you that protection, not conservation, protection is the key towards sustaining and maintaining your resources. So a lot of management issues are being driven by protection and not sustainable use and sustainable development. So we have irrational close seasons, we have irrational protection plans that cannot justify whether or not they can help to enhance two things, the development of the industry and the sustainable livelihood of those that are in the industry. What I noticed that is happening in international communities that politicians in Europe and the United States think that marine resources are expendable. So they will give to their environmental, their, their environmental community what we call the red meat of marine resource protection. Go there, fly in trade, protect everything. But those terrestrial issues that are of economic importance to these countries, don't touch these. So talk all what you want about fisheries protection in other people's uh, exclusive economic zone. But please don't tell me anything about how I deal with other matters of animal rights in my country. So you find that you have a lot of conflict within the marine environment as to how we, as coastal people, see the developmental pathway for marine resource use as to the, 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 the lens that is being seen for this development from NGOs and other government programs that are coming from Europe and from the USA. Let's take, for instance, at CITES, many times, most of the restrictive uh, 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 initiatives that CITES adopt, they are not brought to CITES by the countries that are being affected. But these are influenced a lot by countries that say, look, see over there in Dominica, or over there in Antigua, we need to protect the mountain chicken. Or we need to protect the conch. Nobody starts to say what those mean to the people that are using them. Nobody starts to say how these things will be neutralized many, many years without being in danger as they are now. But projects are developed around these concepts, and immediately they became, they, they, the concept become part of our regulatory framework to protect something, to stop you something that is not really overutilized, but are just being seen within the, the, the fancy, like the Moby Dick, or, or, or um, this book, help me, uh, please, Milton, there was a book that was written by Miss Mahal, Robin Mahal, uh, uh, was it Rudolph the Lobster, where they tell this narrative about this poor little baby lobster that just leave home Leroy the lobster. And Leroy <laughs> just left his, uh, his, 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 his cave and not come a fisherman and so we could take that lobster. And nobody think about that lobster is part of our livelihood. But they're painting a picture that the fishermen are taking Leroy <laughs> and Leroy have a soul and we're doing everything wrong. And that is the protectionist posture that is being placed on our resources, that is wrong. We understand the issue of sustainability. We understand the need for conservation. But what we do not understand is why should we adopt something that has nothing to do with the sustainable use of the resource, but just protecting it because it is 
my pet, my pet project. Or it is singing through the lens of a country where for you are. He's like oh, an elephant that you. I want to get back on a point and wrap up. Um, <laughs> but what we need to understand is that we have to collaborate with like-minded countries, like-minded organizations, NGOs, that see the use of our resources within the framework of how we ourselves see, seize it. Because if we don't do that, we will have a problem in terms of setting developmental programs, programs and developmental plans that can benefit us from, from the standpoint of food security and sustainable livelihoods for all people. So the time has come for us to look at property rights for fishermen, as far as the ocean is concerned, for us to look at uh, setting the dichotomy between preservation, <coughs> protection, and sustainable management. So I'd like to just put that on the table for now, and then I'll be around the Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank we we'll certainly look forward to hearing from you again as we close off this seminar and later on. <laughs>